There are many issues to think about. There's the whole economic growth aspect. There's long run issues potentially on fertility. Uh, there are issues obviously on mortality and on the health status of the population. And there are issues that, that, that involve the labor market and thinking about both labor market participation, uh, wage patterns, and uh, how all of those things may influence the way in which people interact with the social security system and potentially the DI system as well. Uh, the, the piece of this very complicated puzzle uh, that we've chosen to focus on today is, is the labor market component. So I am delighted that we have uh, Steve Goss, the Chief Actuary at SSA, and Karen Glenn, the Deputy Chief Actuary, with us today. Uh, the way this will work is they're going to start by saying a little bit about the, the broad overview and how some of the, the COVID-19 aspects fit into thinking about Social Security. Then we have three leading labor economists who are going to be able to talk about some of the implications of COVID-19 for the labor market. Uh, Catherine Abraham from the University of Maryland, also the former commissioner of the BLS, and one of our nation's leading labor market experts, is going to think about some of the aspects around participation. Uh, Michael Stepner, <clears throat> who is at the University of Toronto and is one of the people who's associated with the, the Opportunity Insights team at Harvard that was producing you know, nearly real-time estimates of what was happening in the labor market during the, the early months of the pandemic, uh, is gonna share some of the lessons on what we've seen in terms of different groups in the labor market. And Till Von Wachter uh, at UCLA, who was part of the California Policy Lab and was doing a fantastic job of managing to bring together different administrative data sets to track the consequences of the pandemic, including very importantly for the labor market in California, will then share some insights on some of the aspects of the labor market that he was able to observe in all of this. And we will then circle back and let Karen and Steve kind of wrap up based on uh, what we've heard about the labor market and some of their thinking. And then we'll open up for some, some general commentary as we go along. So with that, I'm gonna turn, I think Steve, you're gonna be the, the opening uh, speaker. Great, thank you very much, Jim. Karen, if you could pop the one or two slides forward. Has control. Okay, so first of all, just, just a tiny little bit on COVID background. All of this should be probably familiar. I think last year we talked about the three waves back in 1918 for the so called Spanish flu. Uh, and of course, we have a little picture here from last Saturday of, uh, of information CDC had through Friday of last week. And you can see, unfortunately, that uh, much as many and all had hoped uh, we were going to be done with this, lo and behold, we are into a, uh, into, into a summer little resurgence here. Uh, and you will see, in fact, that on Thursday and Friday of last week, the daily uh, reported infections uh, to CDC, in fact, have moved back up above the 50,000 level, uh, which is unfortunate. And you can see that the deaths are also sort of moving back towards trending up. So we are into another wave now. Just how long and how, how large it's gonna be is yet to be seen. And of course, we're not even into the fall and winter coming. So this really just by way of saying that uh, labor market uh, implications obviously are following what the pandemic is doing and have been following what the pandemic is doing. Uh, the labor market has obviously uh, uh, changed a lot since uh, the biggest lockdowns, but uh, the question is what's gonna be facing this going forward. So on the next slide, uh, uh, just wanted to share with you a little bit about sort of what we've been doing since the last time we the NDR summer session. Uh, some might recall the, ninth, the, the 2020 trustees report. I see several people on there in addition to Karen and myself who are much involved in that, uh, did uh, not reflect the uh, pandemic. Uh, there was just not time to, to put together the, you know, have a solid sense of what the sense of the pandemic was going to be on the economy, on social security. So what we in Austin Chief actually did at SSA back in November 24, if I'm recalling the right date, we did put together uh, something that was published uh, on the web at that time. It was based largely on work that we had done back in September, talking with a lot of epidemiologists and others and economists about what was going on and the impressions of what was happening in the economy and uh, in the health sector uh, and try, did take our best shot at that time of putting together some numbers. It was really done at the behest of our auditors from the last trustees report, uh, 2020. And so we put together what was referred to as a subsequent event. 
looking at what the effects of the pandemic and the ensuing recession were, uh, what our best expectations were at the time. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, we'll be going through a little bit of that term, we'll describe a little bit of that in here, and of course, what, what the expected effects are going forward. Uh, obviously, the, the effects have been dramatic in many, many ways. But the labor market is especially interesting. That's why we're so interested in hearing the feedback from all of you. And by the way, so great to see all your faces. This is really nice. So I think I'm passing the baton now on the next slide to Karen. Great, thank you, Steve. And thank you, for Jim, for inviting us to speak again today. Um, as Steve mentioned, we did an update in the fall of 2020 to try to bring in the effects of COVID on Social Security. So we're gonna go through a little bit of sort of what was our thinking at the time and what is our thinking now? So obviously a few months have gone by since fall of 2020. Um, so you can see that our thinking will have evolved on any of these topics. So um, first, just kind of in general, our thinking back in fall 2020 was that over the 75 year long range period, the effects of COVID and the ensuing recession would likely be pretty minor. Um, our thoughts would, were that we would be largely recovered by 2023 with little permanent effect. Um, one thing to note is that trustees reports have generally incorporated the likelihood of periodic negative events, not specifically pandemics, but just the idea that every once in a while, something bad will happen. So one example is on death rates. We have generally assumed an annual improvement in death rates of about 0.73% a year on average. Other forecasters have persistently assumed improvement of about 1% or higher with no deceleration. So you can see that sort of on average, we have built in the likelihood of things not going well in the future. Um, similarly, unemployment rates. Trustees reports have typically assumed unemployment rates in the long run um, a little bit higher on average than most other forecasters. Again, just reflecting the fact that over the long run, you're gonna have these cycles and some of them will be negative. Um, so in the near term though, clearly COVID has many, many near term considerations and we'll go through a few of those now. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the 2021 trustees report has not yet been released. Um, so stay tuned over the next few weeks for where we actually stand on that. Okay, um, this graph, not very extensive, so hopefully it's, it's pretty clear. What this shows is when the reserves of the combined OASDI trust funds will go to zero. And the dark blue solid line is where we were at the time of the 2020 trustees report. So at that time, we were assuming, or we were projecting, that the trust funds would become depleted in 2035. With this updated baseline, that shifted back to 2034. And I'm not gonna get into the details on the individual trust funds. You know, OASDI is made up of OASI and DI, and there were different effects on the two of those. Again, stay tuned for what we, project in the 2021 trustees report. So getting into a little bit more detail on the specific factors, um, we know the demographic factors aren't the focus of today's presentations, but we wanted to just give you a, a really quick overview of our thinking on some of the more important things. So mortality. Um, back in fall 2020, we were assuming that there would only be a modest fall wave. Um, we were assuming that overall mortality rates for the full year 2020 would be about 12% higher than we would have assumed in the absence of the pandemic. That translates into about 350,000 excess deaths for the year. Um, those of you who have followed the statistics carefully, or not even all that carefully, I think it was pretty much out there in the news, um, we ended up doing much worse than that. The fall wave was significant. The winter wave was even more significant going into 2021. 
believe excess deaths ended up at about 500,000, depending exactly on how you measure that. So um, we were underestimating at the time. Um, similarly, we assumed um, increases for 2021 and 2022 of about 6% and 2%. Um, at least 2021 ended up significantly too low. Uh, it's looking like that will be more like 16% or 15%, more like 2020, um, just because things were so bad in the late winter, early spring. And, you know, as Steve was pointing out in his graph, things may be turning up again. Hopefully that's mainly just case counts and not so much on deaths, but um, I think that's really still to be determined. Um, going forward for mortality, just a, a few factors we're still thinking about. Will the increases in death rates continue to be similar across all adult ages? Um, while there are significantly more deaths at older ages, the death rates at almost all adult ages are pretty similar, not much of a gradient there. Um, one thing that I think was on the last slide that I did not really mention is that for younger folks, like below about age 18, death rates actually went down during the pandemic, um, possibly due to you know less risky behavior, just not being out in the world as much. Um, but anyway, there, were, there was a different differential between those two age groups. Um, longer term, will there be persistent effects on mortality? Obviously, there's the direct virus-related immediate deaths. There are some indirect, indirect deaths due to deferred care. Um, there were also some increased deaths of despair or violence, increased suicides and homicides during the pandemic. And then really the long-term question related to mortality is, will there be decreased life expectancy in the future for those folks who were infected by COVID? Um, long COVID is getting lots of attention right now. What will really be the long-term effects of that? Um, last bullet here, data available to date and the medical implications are still unclear. We're still trying to learn all we can. Um, on the fertility side, real quickly, um, we did assume that the pandemic would affect birth rates in years 2021 through 2025. We assumed lower birth rates in 2021 and 22, but then a full makeup over the next few years um, before returning to where we would have been in 2026. Uh, really, this just reflects an assumed deferral of births, not a decrease in overall births. Um, what do we know now? Unfortunately, not too much more, um, just because you know, there's there's obviously a nine month of delay in in the time from conception to birth. We do have a little bit of state data from the beginning of 2021. Um, birth rates are very low. Um, whether they're actually lower than what we assumed, not quite clear yet. Um, will there be a makeup? Uh, that's still to be determined. All right, moving on to a couple of economic effects. Uh, which I know you folks will be interested in. Um, direct GDP effects. So this graph has a lot going on, but let me kind of orient you. This is real GDP levels, dollar billions, going from 2020 to 2024 by quarter. So these are various forecasts um, starting in Q1 2020. Um, the solid lines are what folks were thinking last fall. So you can see we've got CBO, IHS, Moody's, and our uh, updated baseline, which is the red line there. Um, you can see that we were on probably the high end of expectations back in the fall. Um, then the next thing we'll look at is the dashed lines. That's more like what people are thinking now. And you can see that right now, those projections are more optimistic than they were a few months ago. So uh, maybe we made a good guess there, but it seems like we were probably um, on the right track. Obviously, most of these are projections of the future, so anything could happen. But 
um, we are certainly in line with where folks are now. The labor force and employment. Um, this graph, same, same concept, solid lines are what people were thinking back in the fall, dashed lines are, are what folks are thinking now. Um, this one's a little more all over the place. <laughs> so the red line is where we were in our fall update. The, the dashed lines, you can see that especially by Q4 2024, um, they're, they're all over the place. I think this really just reflects people have different views of the future and what the labor force is going to bring. Obviously, for Social Security, employment is critical. That's what flows directly into our payroll tax revenue. It's, it's really critical for our finances. And last economic graph I want to show you here, pretty similar to the first one, actually. But this is um, nominal wages and salaries. Um, again, solid lines are what folks were thinking in fall 2020. And our estimate then is the red line. Um, again, you know, things are a little more optimistic right now. Uh, we do know there was a stronger recovery in 2020 Q3 for now than had been expected at the time. So this, this really reflects that. And I think I am going to turn it back over to Steve. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, so first, before talking a little bit about this, what I at least think is a very interesting slide, uh, let me just mention a couple real quick things. First of all, just wanted to emphasize what Karen was saying that our, our November 24 update, actually the development of that was, uh, and our work on that was done in September of last year before any of the October and later fall, fall wave came in. So we were, dare I say, sort of flying blind on that, as we all were at that time. And that explains a lot about why a lot of expectations by many, including us, were probably not uh, as good as, uh, as we wish they had been. Another little item I just wanted to mention in terms of long COVID, I'm sure everybody has seen, in fact, I think probably several on this uh, uh, on this Zoom were probably involved in talking with Time Magazine. We weren't, but Time Magazine recently came out with something about long COVID. I just wanted to point out, probably many of you are even more familiar than I. We, we talked to a lot of epidemiologists, and I was a little bit taken aback when they were referring to 10 to 30 percent of patients having long COVID, and yet they applied that to the total number of people who have been identified as ever having been infected. Our understanding from epidemiologists is the something like 10% applies more to people who had uh, uh, strong reactions and were really sickened, and not just everybody who was infected. So I think the long COVID thing in Time Magazine was probably a little bit overplayed, uh, at least per perhaps that's just wishful thinking. So back to the topic of the moment, Jim, don't want to get too far off of, uh, uh, of the idea of the labor market. It's one thing we've been paying a lot of attention to uh, not just recently uh, because of COVID, but just in general because of uh, the changing patterns in productivity growth, changing patterns in our disability applications, lots and lots of reasons for us to be looking at trends in employment. And I'm so glad that Catherine is on here because this is some material pulled pretty recently from some BLS, so much good stuff up on the web. And this shows you by these six different broad employment sectors. In fact, they're broken down much more finely on the BLS website, which uh, uh, the graph was too big to be able to do that uh, here. But it sort of shows you across these employment sectors what has been going on since 2010. Uh, and you can see for each of the employment sectors, some more than others, there was a hit in 2020, not at all surprising in terms of the average employment during the year 2020 compared to what had been in the prior year and certainly re relative to the trending. Uh, and in some areas more than others, obviously service occupations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the question is, where are we going to be going with these in the future? We know that in 2021, we've had a lot of recovery. Uh, and again, per the very first slide where we were looking at what the pandemic is doing and what it's doing as we speak. Uh, and as we go into the next several months, uh, it's going to have sort of further implications. We will see on that. But we see here for the for, for the management and professional, they have been rising as a share. Uh, these, are, these are actually absolute numbers employed. So numbers employed have been, almost all the rise has been happening in management and professional. 
and uh, not in a lot of the jobs which uh, tend to be perhaps more likely to be laid off. Uh, the next, uh, and, and of course, our, our gigantic question here, not just in the context of COVID, although COVID is clearly a factor, and if it turns out to be more than just a very short-term item, which many epidemiologists are concerned it will be, uh, it might have more lasting effects than just what we're seeing on the dark little bars here for 2020. So we can also look at this, though, uh, on the next slide, which puts it in terms of percentage population. Uh, and it's, it's much the same, although this puts in a little bit different framework. Uh, we still see the rises for management and professional, but we, see, we certainly see how sales uh, and office occupations have been declining. And one of the things we're obviously wondering about in the longer term and the extent to which COVID is going to sort of really uh, put a little bit of extra flame on the fire here is movement towards things like telework and, and distant working for so many jobs that are possible in the economy. Uh, will we be having fewer retail store situations and more Amazon flybys with drones uh, coming in the future? Uh, there's a lot of possibilities for changing the employment sector. Uh, and in the very near term, we've seen a ton of that from COVID. And the question is how much of that will stick? What's gonna be the half-life of these items? Uh, so really looking forward to, to Catherine, Mike, and Till uh, for their views and everybody else's going on. So on the next slide, uh, we uh, just wanted to share, and on the slide after that, one item with respect to the uh, average wage. We, we, there's been much discussion about this at, around June, July last year, when we and many thought that wages during the year 2020, aggregate wages, were for the balance of the year going to be much diminished. It has turned out that wages were not as much diminished as we and others had expected. Uh, we, at the time of our September work that contributed to the November update, we were expecting that wages would be depressed enough during the year, sort of across the board, that the average wage from 2019 to 2020 might actually be lowered, uh, and this is in nominal terms, uh, on the order of 4%. Earlier than that, we, were, we and others were expecting it might be as much as 6%. And that was across the board. People, uh, everybody who was opining was thinking that back around July. By September, we were thinking maybe 4%. As it turns out, because of the differential impacts uh, on different portions of the labor force, uh, things have worked out really quite differently than had been expected back then. And it looks as though uh, we are, in fact, probably, well, more than probably, Karen, probably essentially certainly we can share with you at this point, the average wage uh, uh, on that is, this is the average wage for the total wages during the year divided by the number of people work at any time during the year, whether it be for a day over 365 days during the year. So on that concept, we are now expecting there will indeed be an increase uh, in the average wage for the year, which is good news for beneficiaries who will start receiving benefits in 2022 because had there been a drop in the average wage, that would have negatively affected their benefits for life, uh, but for possible legislation. And that has not been the case now. It looks like we will indeed have an increase uh, for them and going forward. So we are learning so much along the way. So on the next slide, we're getting close to the end here, getting ready to go to Catherine and others. Uh, timing of benefit applications, we just wanted to share with you that in the time of COVID, very much related to the employment effects on the labor effects, we've been seeing some very interesting changes uh, in uh, the timing of people applying for benefits. On the retirement side, we haven't really seen that much. It's not entirely clear. Some of what have been opining that, well, under COVID, a lot of people who might have retired but uh, can now work at home, they're gonna keep working. On the other hand, a lot of people have opined that a lot under COVID uh, with, with more people moving to unemployment, uh, at least in the, in the early term, we might have a lot of people retiring earlier on balance it does not appear as though there's been a lot of effect on that. On the next slide, however, we can share with you that uh, on disability applications, that there, there has been a bigger effect there. You can see that uh, prior to the Great Recession, you can see about the levels that we had for our uh, disability applications. We talk of these field offices. These are numbers of people actually who apply online or have walked into a field office and apply the number of initial DDS applications those are people who actually make it to the state agencies to be considered. And you can see what those numbers were back in around 2003 through 2010, fairly level. And then it jumped up as a result of the Great Recession. 
uh, and with a little bit of a delay, of course, because what we have seen is that when uh, a recession comes along, when a lot of people move into unemployment, they might be tending to, to file for, for disability benefits, but there's a tendency to wait until the unemployment compensation has run out to do that. So you can see we had a run from 2010, 11, 12, but the dramatic drop in applications uh, and number of disability awards since then has been really quite strong. Uh, and uh, it has continued into 2020, as you can see, at, at least in part, we believe because of the COVID implications. Uh, but in fact, really, it's uh, just an extension of the, uh, of the trend that we've been seeing ever since 2010 to relatively low levels now. And one of the gigantic questions we're gonna have again, perhaps again related to the changing nature of work and employment in our society, again, where it's been really uh, uh, enhanced by, by COVID, uh, will that continue to hold us to lower disability rates than we had seen in the past? And will that continue into the future or is this just a temporary phenomenon? And with that, I believe we may be one more little slide uh, and that is employment effects. So employment effects, gigantic questions, hoping to learn more in the balance of this panel and, and in the coming months. Uh, much discussion by us and others about what are the implications of the gig economy. We also know that uh, uh, an, a, a very large share, more than half of self-employment income in this country is in fact not reported, so we don't have good records on that. Uh, will that be changing over time? We don't really know. Remote work for many, many occupations, uh, that has obviously been ramped up considerably. Look at what we're all doing today. Uh, and to what extent will that continue? What is what will be the half-life of the changes that have been made? Uh, there are obviously efficiencies, but there are also losses. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, you know, missing out on the, on the clam bake is, is, is really a serious issue for many of us. So uh, we're, we're hoping to get back uh, in the future to what was the old reality, but we will see. Uh, the degree of longer term persistent effects on the economy and economic and demographic factors is yet we believe unknowable, but uh, we are paying close attention and looking forward to all of your thoughts and comments. And on that, I believe we have one more slide, which is the lead into everybody else. So again, thank you very much. Great, thank you. And that was just Karen and Steve, that was a fantastic overview and it provides the precisely, you know, attracted setup to now focus on some of the specifics about the labor market. So with that, I'm gonna to move to Catherine uh, ask her to share screen and to tell us about some of the things she's been seeing and, and is focusing on with respect to labor force participation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let me um, get my full screen here. Great, so I appreciated the opportunity this gives me to um, think a little bit about what the implications of, of COVID are for labor force participation going forward. Uh, can I just check that my, my screen is shared properly? It's, it's shared, but it's still not full screen. Huh. Okay. Um, there we go. Oh, so now I just made it not full screen. I think there's just a the lag here. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll assume that it will sort itself out. Okay, so I, as starting, um, it, it seemed like it would be a good idea rather than just starting with COVID to start with a little bit of historical context for what had been happening to labor force participation before COVID. I think people in this group are, are probably pretty aware of what has happened to the labor force participation rate, which is the line in orange, and also the employment to population ratio, which is the line in, in blue. Both of these have been trending downwards in the aggregate for quite some time. The labor force participation over the 20 years leading up to 2019 had fallen by about four percentage points, which is, as these things go, a pretty big decline. Um, I think we have a pretty good understanding of what was driving that. Part of it is due to the aging of the baby boomers. People you know, get to retirement age, they're less likely to be working. But there also were significant declines in participation concentrated in particular groups. 
Uh, people 16 to 24 in school are much less likely to participate at, as of 2019 than they were 20 years earlier. And that was part of what was driving this. So, and Catherine, then there I'm just also interrupt were... you for a second. I, your slides are not moving. Okay. Let me. I don't know why this is. Let me stop I... sharing and try again. Um, okay. What are you? What are you seeing? Jeff? We're seeing pre-COVID trends. Okay. And that's good. Now are you seeing pre-COVID trends? Yep. And we're seeing it full screen. Good. Okay, good. Yep. Um, Thank you. So, and then, so the aging of the baby boomers, the decline in participation among in-school in youth, and then big declines in participation among non-college educated prime age workers, which I, I think the evidence suggests is best explained by what's happened to the labor demand for that group in a context where people did have other alternatives, importantly, applying for disability insurance. Uh, that was partly reversed at the end of the 2010s, but, but certainly not entirely. All of that was partially offset by big increases in participation among older adults. Um, some of that's due to the fact that the older population is becoming more educated, but actually what's more important is that at every education level, people are working longer than they were in the past. So that's the context for heading into uh, COVID. Um, so what has happened to labor force participation and the employment to population ratio during the, the, the COVID period? Um, you can see the very sharp declines in both labor force participation and the employment to population ratio at the beginning of the crisis in the spring of 2020. What has a lot of labor economists puzzled is the fact that after an initial very sharp rebound, things have not gotten a lot better. So labor force participation in particular you know, rebounded quite a bit, but then it stalled. So we are still, at a labor force participation rate that's nearly a couple percentage points below where it had been before all of this started. And so I think that's the thing that we're interested in understanding and, and that will have important effects potentially going forward for social security. So what are the explanations that people have pointed to as to why labor force participation hasn't recovered? Health concerns may be a factor. Family responsibilities may be a factor. Uh, lack of demand for certain types of workers may be a factor, and then potentially the role of unemployment insurance disincentives. So what I, I thought might be useful would be to try to look for clues about what's going on, which of these stories might be responsible in the changes in participation broken out by demographic groups. So looking separately at people by age, by sex, by the presence of children in the home, um, and also by whether they're in school or not, and for older people, what their level of educational attainment is. So I wanna just take a couple minutes and, and look at some of that. I'll start with the 16 to 24 year olds who for some you know, for purposes of thinking about social security really are the least important of all of these groups because it's gonna be so long before they're at an age to be collecting social security. I've broken this out by whether they're teenagers or in their early 20s and also by whether they're in school or not. The thing that sort of jumps off the page to me about these numbers is that the group where we've really seen significant decline, consistent declines for both men and women in participation is the group who are in, in school. I, I don't know how worried we should would be about that. Um, I, I suspect that that has to do with demand effects. If schools are closed, people aren't on campus, work that they might have done during the semester, they're, they're not going to be doing. I should have said that I'm looking here at the period in, of the first quarter of 2021 and comparing that to the first quarter of 2020. Um, labor force participation hasn't changed too much since then, and there's also issues of seasonality that make it harder to look at different 
different periods for these not seasonally adjusted data. The more important groups for social security are the people age 25 and, and up. Um, I've broken this out for men and women by age group and then also by level of education. There's a couple things that jump out at me in these data. Uh, the first is the much larger declines in participation for people age 65 and older. That's really clear for men. It's somewhat less clear for women, but if you average out across these different education groups, for both men and women, the percentage decline in participation is two to four times as big in that age group as in any of the other age groups. That's very consistent, I think, with health concerns driving a desire not to keep working. Um, there's no consistent pattern here by education. You're seeing these declines both for low educated people and for, for higher educated people. A second thing that jumps out of these numbers to me is the very strong age gradient in uh, both for people age 25 to 54 to a somewhat lesser extent for people in their their 50s and early 60s you know unfortunately that doesn't help us too too much with figuring out what's going on because that could be driven by health concerns if more educated less educated people are doing more in-person type work it could be driven by lack of demand it could be driven by unemployment insurance incentives at least in principle a last thing to point out here is the substantially larger declines in participation for women. Look at the 25 to 54 year old age group versus men. Some people looking at that have said, well, maybe what's going on is that it's family responsibilities that are keeping women out of the labor, the labor force. Um, there's an interesting recent paper by Jason Furman, Melissa Carney, and Wilson Powell that tried to take a look at this. I've, I've adapted what they did to look at labor force participation. If that was what was going on, you would expect to see that among women in particular, that the declines in participation would be much bigger for women who have children under the age of 13 at home than for those who don't. Um, if you look at women who have less than a BA degree, it's a, a little bit bigger decline for the women with children, but it's only a percentage point. And if you push the numbers through, it can explain hardly any of the decline in participation we've seen um, because they're just not that big a group. And if you look at people with a bachelor's degree, you don't even see that pattern at all. So I, I find that to be pretty compelling evidence that family responsibilities aren't what's driving what we're seeing. So what can we, we take away from these, these clues that we get by looking at differences by demographics? Um, I think the patterns are certainly consistent with health concerns having been important, uh, both the differences by education level and the, the very large declines among people over age 65. I don't think the patterns are consistent with family responsibilities driving this. Um, and then the patterns are also, particularly the education gradient, are consistent with a number of stories, and I, I wish there was a better way to sort them out. It could be health, it could be labor demand factors. In principle, it could be unemployment disincentives, though I think the evidence against that story that I'm not going to talk about is actually pretty compelling. I think Michael may have more to say about that. The bigger question for Social Security is, are these effects going to persist? And I, I, I have to agree with Steve, it's just very hard to say, given what we know now, whether you, what the persistent effects of this will be. Um, health concerns may have a continuing effect on keeping people out of the labor force. It's gonna depend a lot on vaccination rates and also how effective the vaccines are against the new variants. You know, my guess would be that people past the age of 65 who have left the labor market are unlikely to return. In terms of effects on Social Security, though, that's not going to be too important because many of these people would have retired within a few years regardless. Um, a, a big unknown is whether these shifts in demand that we've seen will persist beyond the pandemic. There's a, a, a school of thought 
uh, exemplified by the interesting paper by Barrero, Bloom, and Davis that was published in the Brookings papers last year that argues that a lot of the shifts we're seeing will persist, that with teleworking, downtowns are going to die, that we aren't going to see business travel, which will affect airlines and hotels and restaurants. You look at some of these high tech companies, Facebook says it's going to move to a largely remote workforce, but then they're buying office space in Manhattan. They bought a whole office building in Manhattan. So it's, it's just very unclear what these shifts in demand are going to look like. They could be important in that we know that shifts in demand have depressed labor force participation for less educated workers you know, for a long time, and this could exacerbate that. And then finally, there is an argument that sort of lifestyle changes prompted by the pandemic could lead to permanent changes in the way that, that uh, people supply labor to the labor market. They read all of these stories about people deciding that it's just not worth it to be working as hard as I was and I'm not going to return to work. It's just very hard to say one way or the other. If I had to guess, I would say that the long run effects on labor force participation will be pretty modest, but there's certainly a lot of things to keep an eye on. So let me stop with that. Great. That, that's just terrific. I mean, thank you for giving us that overview. It, there's lots to think about there, but also a lot that we are, I think, seeing already, right, that is that is very informative on how this is all uh, working. Okay, so with that, let me uh, shift gears and turn to Michael Stepner, uh, looking at some of the, the high frequency and other data that, uh, that, that the Opportunity Insights team has put together and that Michael's played a, a leading role in, in working on. Thank you, Jim. So I'm really excited. Uh, I think this talk uh, is going to be very complementary to um, the demographic breakdowns that we were just looking at. And I want to give credit. I've been working on this with Raj Chetty and John Friedman and Nathan Hendren and a fantastic team of young researchers based at Opportunity Insights who have been processing the data from all of these private sector firms on the bottom right uh, of the screen uh, into economically interpretable series. And so in this talk, I want to start on the solid grounds, the story we're familiar with uh, over the course of the pandemic, and end with the open questions uh, that I hope will lead us into a really productive discussion during this panel. And so this story really starts with a massive shortfall in GDP starting in the second quarter of 2020, where GDP fell by 32% relative to the first quarter. And if you disaggregate that, most of that fall was driven by a change in personal consumption expenditure. And even the majority still can be explained by changes in the types of consumption that are measurable on credit cards. And so let's start to look at how credit card spending changed over the course of the pandemic. And what we see is that if we break this out into the top income quartile and the bottom income quartile, there was a huge shortfall in spending of about $3 billion per day that started in March and hit its trough in April, followed by a slow but incomplete recovery over the course of 2020, where even toward the end of 2020, high income spending remained $700 million lower per day uh, than it did than it was before the pandemic or than it was in 2019. Whereas at the bottom of the income distribution, you had about a $1 billion shortfall in spending at that uh, trough, followed by actually a complete recovery in spending as the safety net programs kicked in. So there's this big disparity in who stopped spending during the pandemic, as well as a disparity in what they stopped spending money on. So contrary to a typical recession, where you see a large shortfall in spending on durable goods, what we saw during the COVID pandemic was that the majority of the decline, two thirds of the decline in spending was focused on in-person services. So if you compare that to the Great Recession, this is a very different concentration of where people's spending fell. And so all of these spending changes over the course of the pandemic had rippled through the economy, through business revenues into employment, and we can pick up those effects when we look at the disparities in employment. And so I think, um, We've already seen a really nice breakdown of the disparities by different demographics and what we can learn from that. I hope to present a complementary um, analysis of the disparities by income group. 
And so if we look at the shortfall in employment uh, in the bottom income quartile, there was a 35% decline initially in employment, 12 million, but 12 million low income workers out of a job in April of 2020, followed by a large but incomplete recovery. That recovery has basically stagnated since the summer of last year, with it remains about 20% of low income workers who were employed in 2019 remain out of a job. Now, qualitatively, those drop, there was a drop for all income groups at the beginning of the pandemic. Everyone was suffering in April of 2020, but in terms of employment, the recession ended for high income workers by June of 2020, where high income workers returned to their jobs for the most part, and employment at the top of the income distribution has returned to 2019 levels and has been at 2019 levels since the summer of 2020. So I want to spend much of the rest of the talk unpacking what are the mechanisms driving this extremely asymmetric effect of COVID on employment. And I think the natural starting point is to think that this might have to do with the concentration of the um, effects of the pandemic in certain industries that might disproportionately employ low income workers, as well as in certain areas where low income work uh, is most prevalent. And so I can immediately rule that out as a major source of the story by re-weighting low wage work to match the top income quartile by county and by industry. So this story where we see this large asymmetry is not explained by just what industries these workers are in and what counties they're living in. There's something else going on here. And if we actually focus on the retail sector, I think this becomes especially stark where Retail consumption, you had that initial spike when everyone went out to buy toilet paper, and then that initial decline when everyone stayed home and didn't go out of their homes as we had no idea what was happening in April of 2020. And afterwards, the spending on goods actually was higher than in a typical year. And high wage employment recovered accordingly, similarly to consumer spending, while low wage employment remained uh, depressed and remains depressed today. And so despite the fact that spending fully recovered and in fact more than recovered, low wage employment remains depressed. So let's talk through the mechanisms. And here's where I transition from having answers to having questions, informed questions, but questions nonetheless that I think uh, can inform a broader discussion with uh, Steve and Karen and um, Till and, um, and the, whole, uh, the whole audience. But let's talk about mechanisms. And through, to organize this discussion, I want to uh, focus on two dimensions of the mechanisms. The mechanisms that fall on the labor demand side versus the labor supply side, and then unpacking to what extent we think these changes might be transitory or permanent. And throughout this talk, I'm actually going to skip over the health concerns, which I think are no doubt a massive a factor in the short run. But I think when we think about the long run, 10, 15, 20 years, the sorts of things that are affecting Social Security, I think um, I'd like to focus on the types of factors that might sort of persist throughout the new normal. And so let's start by talking about labor demand factors. And I think there are two uh, key ones to think about in this asymmetric recovery. And the first is the shift in activity, economic activity from small businesses to large businesses and from in-person services to online services. So during the pandemic, we saw large big box stores and online retailers like Amazon and Target posting record profits while small businesses closed at record rates. And those small businesses tend to employ uh, more workers per, uh, per uh, dollar of um, sales while large businesses like Amazon are very efficient and highly focused on efficiency. And so I think one key question is to what extent these shifts in economic activity will last in the new normal. A second change is just changes in the way a given business produces its output, whether that's increased automation through self-checkout, changes in how production is made through um, automation in robotics, and you know, the work of David Otter and others argues that to some extent, 
the pandemic has accelerated existing shifts. We were already moving in this direction, but in the face of huge disruptions, there was an opportunity for business to move faster to the automated future that we were already heading toward. I have more data on the labor supply factors where I think there's three uh, that I think about a lot. The moral hazard effect of expanded safety net payments, the liquidity effect of those safety net payments, and changes in preferences. And starting with the moral hazard effect, I think there's been fantastic work on this uh, from the team at JP Morgan Chase Institute. I saw Pascal Noel presenting this work last week at the public economics section. And um, what they find is that the moral hazard from the end of the that they can detect from the end of the six hundred dollar supplements, or the end of the three hundred dollar supplements, uh, or the, rather the start of the three hundred dollar supplements more recently, uh, just cannot explain the large shortfalls in employment. So they write that there's little evidence that elevated unemployment insurance benefits discourage people from returning to work. That job finding showed no sustained increase after the supplement expired. More than half of jobless workers who received the $600 supplement returned to work before the supplement ended. And overall, while the supplements expanded spending, they calculate that employment was only a fraction of a percentage point lower as a result of the benefit expansions. Now that would be perhaps substantial when we have 4% unemployment rates, but that doesn't explain the 20% unemployment in the bottom of the income distribution. I think a really interesting open question is to what extent liquidity can explain this, because we've seen record savings over the course of the pandemic. Those have been especially high in the top income quartile, but even at the bottom income quartile, you've had a large expansion of liquidity driven by stimulus checks and unemployment insurance benefits, really driven by an expansion of the safety net. And here in a discussion, I can quote Twitter, where I think uh, Matt Notovadigdo echoes uh, thoughts that I, um, that I really agree with, which is that the work uh, from 2008 on the liquidity and behavioral responses to unemployment insurance suggests that this expanded liquidity might really have a massive impact on people's labor uh, force uh, participation, on their labor supply, and that liquidity effect is unlikely to persist. Uh, it's unlikely to be a permanent effect. That would likely be a transitory effect. And finally, to wrap up, changes in preferences and there I would include health concerns, but also I think, you know, Betsy Stevenson and Erin Dubay have been writing about this, that a lot of the changes in, um, that one of the key changes we see are, are a massive expansion in quits, where quits are especially high right now. It's not just that people who are outside of the labor force are refusing to return, but rather people, there's a lot of churn within the labor force. And when you survey people, do you plan to change industry or look for a new type of occupation, unprecedented numbers of workers reported interest in a change in their jobs. And so we see these changes in preferences driven by really a massive disruption in labor uh, in the labor market that I think change people's reservation wages, uh, which might be driving some of this disequilibrium where employment is low and wages are rising. So I conclude by just saying that the labor market had an unprecedented shock in 2020, unprecedented in size, and it remains in disequilibrium. So on this current, I would say we're on a transition path from the old normal to the new normal. And that transition path involves multiple mechanisms that are affecting both labor demand and labor supply. And I have three key questions that I do not yet know the answer to, but I think will start to be clarified by the work of economists over the coming few months, say over the rest of this year. And the first is how permanent are those shifts in activity across businesses and the shifts in production within businesses? Second, how does labor supply change as benefits are expiring and these liquidity buffers are getting spent down? And finally, how has the bargaining power between employers and employees changed? And will those changes last? Don't have the answers to all of those questions, but I look forward to discussing them with all of you uh, during this uh, panel. And lest anyone think we're gonna succeed in answering those three questions before the end of the panel or before the end of the year or before the end of the decade, I think they will all be with us for quite a while. Uh, but Michael, thank you for, for teeing this up. Uh, Till, let me come to you to talk about further work on UI and also the long-term consequences here of job loss.
Great. <clears throat> can you uh, see my slides moving? We can. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I think what we'll be talking about will be complimentary um, to uh, what Catherine and Michael and Stephen Karen have talked about. I'll start out with uh, presenting a little bit of evidence on labor market effects from California UI claims. And then I'll pivot to talk about this question about the medium to longer term effects of job loss on employment. Um, now, through a cooperation with the California Department of Labor, we uh, obtained access to the universe of unemployment insurance records from California. And the reason that I'm talking to you about this today is that that's data that's typically very hard to access. And in particular during this crisis, uh, given the increase in coverage of UI, we now have an incredible amount of very detailed information of who received UI benefits. And I'll, I'll give you sort of three broad findings among many from our monthly and now quarterly unemployment insurance reports. And again, these are for California, but given the state is very hard to access for the rest of the US, there are some interesting lessons for the US as a whole in there. Now, as uh, you know, Michael and Catherine pointed out, that the crisis uh, was quite unequal in its effect on unemployment rates of different types of workers. And the UI claims data really helps to zoom in on the distributional impacts. And as others have said before, you know, women, younger and older workers, workers of color, and lower educated workers in particular had very high rates of UI claiming and longer UI benefit spells in California. And especially um, older workers and uh, black workers had lower reemployment and, and recall rates. Um, and same was true for lower educated workers. And now what the UI data allows you is to really zoom in um, quite specifically. And here I show you a figure as an example where we looked at the rate of long-term unemployment at the county level and correlated it with county characteristics. And that's helpful because sometimes it's actually a bit difficult to line up UI demographics with say demographics from the uh, survey data, say the ACS. And so here we have ACS county characteristics. And, and you can see that the counties that have a higher rate of long-term unemployment, you know, are over proportionally uh, have an, are, are, are more likely to be black, right? Have a higher share of COVID cases, have a higher share of, of non-citizens of limited English speaking than of population density. And this unequal patterns of the impact of the crisis at the spatial level holds true at the census tract level, it holds true in, 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 in many other measures of unequal impact and also in rates of reemployment. And uh, such data is, is, can be quite useful in thinking how to possibly support workers and communities as federal UI benefits might be running out. Another thing you can really only learn from UI data is that we see that there's among people who are receiving unemployment insurance, there's quite a bit of connection to employment and to past employers, at least in this crisis. So since the fall of 2020, of course, not 21, over 80% of initial UI claims in California were re-entries of workers who had already been laid off, had found a job and filed again for UI. And conversely, again, since the fall of last year, 30 to 40% of those workers who exited UI returned to the UI system. So there's been a lot of churn in and out of employment and in and out of UI. And you also see that a pretty substantial share of workers in, in harder hit sectors by the pandemic, such as food service, work while receiving UI. So UI has not been a state of just long-term unemployment with no work. It's been in and out of UI with partial work and as, as workers get recalled, right, a high share of those that did find a job in 2020 right, return to their past employer. So I think especially in this uh, crisis, the UI system with its increased coverage is a, is a great venue to connect to workers who may be at risk of uh, dropping out of the labor force, especially when um, uh, federal UI benefits expire 
and to try to keep them in the labor force. And that's, of course, most relevant for older workers. And that brings me to my third point from the UI claims data is that all, by and large in this crisis, older workers had, were more heavily impacted than middle-aged workers. That's not true relative to younger workers. Younger workers saw very high rates of UI claiming, but workers who were, were either, either 55 to 64 or 65 and above had a very high share of filing UI benefits in the, in the 12 months since the crisis start, started. And also, had a higher likelihood of experiencing long-term unemployment. And if you look at these numbers that are highlighted, these are just very large rates of UI claimants. 45% sort of, uh, of 55 to 64 year olds in California that were in the labor force in February, 2020 filed for UI. That's just a, a massive uh, group of individuals. And similarly, the, 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 the rates of long-term unemployment um, are, are staggering. And older workers have so far been less likely to find jobs compared to, to uh, middle-aged workers. And um, this, this, these stronger effects on older workers would lead me to, to think, you know, Steve mentioned this, that we haven't seen really a rise in, in uh, early claiming of Social Security, but that's certainly something to watch out for as federal uh, uh, UI benefits expire in the fall. Now, turning now uh, to, to sort of short versus medium versus long run employment effects of, of the crisis. We, we know from past recessions that over the short to medium run, a, a large spike in job losses leads to a, a persistent reduction in, in employment. And if you, you know, do a back of the envelope calculation as I did uh, earlier this year, you, know, you would get you know, a persistent effect lasting 10 to 15 years out uh, on the employment population ratio. And you can think, especially for older workers, for which these drop-off effects are particularly large, that a substitution effect from uh, a, a large wage loss dominates uh, a potential wealth effects because the, 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 the loss in lifetime earnings is not so large if you lose your job closer to retirement. Now, this might look very different over the longer run. In the longer run, if, if workers you know, lose their job in, in midlife or even at younger ages, there, there are potentially quite persistent and large losses in lifetime. And of course, they may have low annual earnings or zeros in their social security earnings system. And these midlife shocks right, could then lead to an, an extension in, in working lives later on. And the idea here is, of course, that the effect from lifetime income dominates uh, a, a substitution effect, if you want to think about it in, in this term. And for somebody who is a full-time worker, extending work, the working life is, of course, one way to recoup some of these losses in, in lifetime earnings. And so to, to, to get a sense of the potential uh, likelihood of this, this happening, I'm going to show you one figure from an analysis of job losses that occurred during the 82 recession. And the, the, the immediate, so short to medium term employment losses from job loss during the 82 recession is similar to what it was, say, during the Great Recession. But the, the advantage of going back to the 82 recession is, of course, that we can look at individuals for, for, for many, many years and we can see how somebody who is displaced at age 35 or 40, right, whether they work longer as they're turning 60 and, and older. Um, and we follow standard uh, assumption in the job displacement literature, and these are estimates for, for men that had, you know, at least a job for, for three years at a, at a mid-sized or larger firms and we compare job losers to a control group of workers that did not lose the job. And here's the one figure summary of, of the findings. And the, the figure shows you the change in average age of filing all the age and survivor benefits, so filing social security for social security benefits. And the, the the horizontal axis of this figure shows you how many years since displacement we're looking at. And so to the left, you see the effect of displacement that occur near retirement age because workers tip, you know, usually can only file at age 62 and usually file between 62 and 65. If you, uh, uh, you see an effect in the short run, these are the job losses that occur when workers were near retirement age. And the job losses to the right here are among workers that lost their job in middle age. And what you see here is that in the first five to 10 years, right, there is 
a decline in claiming age, meaning workers who lost their job closer to retirement age filed benefits earlier. Now, this is reversed as you look past 10 years, especially 15, 20 years after a job loss, workers tend to file later. And you see the same pattern if you look at annual earnings uh, as a measure of, of, or, or the, of labor supply or, or the probability of having any earning in a year. So we see a, a, a short to medium term reduction in, in labor supply that then uh, is, is reversed over the longer run. And that's of course interested, interesting as we think about this large shock during the crisis where a, a large group of individuals was affected at the same time, right? We could sort of think of drawing out a similar curve and predicting what might be going on in the, in the future. And with that, I'm, I'm ready to conclude, right? We've seen a, a, a very unequal distribution of employment losses, and that bears with it a risk of permanent labor force withdrawal and early social security claiming, especially for older, you know, lower income workers that, you know, may then also see a loss in social security benefits or have and have quite low wealth. Um, the second point I made is that the UI system in particular during this crisis could be used to connect to, you know, older workers or other workers at risk of dropping permanently out of the, the labor force. And this is a somewhat understudied subject because usually we just don't have such good data on UI claims. Um, and then finally, it's worth thinking about the sort of short, medium to long term effects of the crisis on employment trends as we're projecting forward what will be happening in the future. And uh, I made the, the point that it might be that the short to medium term effects, which are likely to be persistently negative, right, may be different than the longer run effects. Thank you.